So I'll proceed actually this lecture directly from where we left off last time. And after doing this, I'll actually do a summary uh, of where we are. Uh, and I'll try to give you a big, the, the, the big picture um, within this special topic of uh, rigid body dynamics. So last time where we left off, we defined um, the inertia tensor um, with respect to the center of mass. And uh, I told you that it would be nice to have an expression so that uh, this quantity, uh, which entails integration over the rigid body, does not need to be calculated again and again and again as the object moves, but rather is calculated once and it's updated in a simple manner. And it turns out that that update is, is done through the orthogonal tensor that appears in the description of the rigid body motion. Um, and the update is with respect to the inertia tensor on the reference configuration. So this is the evolution. Okay. So this is something that depends on, on time. Okay. It belongs to the rigid body. And Q is now what depends on time. But on the reference configuration, you calculate J not once, and that's it. So that's what I'll try to show. And actually, the proof is. Uh, rather uh, straightforward, I'll first go ahead and write the express expression for the inertia tensor uh, with respect to the center of mass. So actually, the expression remains the same with respect to any other point. But first, let me write it for the center of mass. So with respect to the center of mass, the relative position vector is denoted with r bar. So we have r bar dot r bar identity minus r bar bon r bar as the expression for the inertia tensor. So if you're looking at any other point, so you would substitute the relative position vector with respect to that point. So now, what we have shown earlier, all the way at the beginning in item number one, is that r bar is equal to Q capital R bar. In other words, the relative position vector of a material point with respect to the center of mass is subject to pure uh, rotation. So what I can do, therefore, is I can plug in here um, Q R bar, Q R bar, right? Here as well, Q R bar, and Q R bar. Now, I'm going to take a number of steps that are rather straightforward. First of all, I'm going to pull this integral back onto the reference configuration because I have some referential quantity appearing there. Uh, and that's what I'd like to work with. So I'm going to put an R0 there, R0 there. And this is going to be eventually D capital V. Okay. Um, then I notice that if I take this term to the left-hand side of the dot product, it needs to be a Q transpose. But Q transpose Q is equal to identity. right? I take it to the left-hand side. It's Q transpose Q. That's an identity. And therefore, this thing is actually equal to R bar dot R bar. And that is something I expect, because rotation does not change the magnitude of elements. This is pure rotation. And finally, I'm going to write this as Q, Q transpose. That's still also identity. And right, we're making use of a number of identities we have previously uh, derived. So this one also can be written as Q goes outside of the bun as it is, whereas the Q on the right goes outside of the bun as a Q transpose. Okay. Right. So therefore, I have the result that expresses JCM in terms of Q Q transpose, right, appears in both. So now, actually, I can throw in, if you like, also an identity there. Okay, That also doesn't change anything. So Q comes outside, Q transpose comes outside. And what I'm left with is an integral over the reference configuration, rho naught r bar dot r bar identity minus r bar bon r bar. D capital V. Okay. And 
Now I notice this to be just the moment of the, the inertia tensor, but not on the current configuration, but rather on the reference configuration, and I'm going to denote it as such. Okay? And that's the proof. Okay, so again, the idea is that you don't want to carry out this integration at every uh, time in a numerical setting at every time step because it would cost time to integrate for a complex object. So you want to do it only once and then you want to make it evolve in a simple manner. So now that we also have this part out of the way, uh, let me give you a summary of where we are, where we're heading, and what our goal is. Okay. So remember, we have a rigid body motion description right, of this form. And uh, I know that that form is quite simple, right? Uh, but why do we have this motion? Why is there a rotation? Why is there a translation? We have a rotation and translation because we exert forces and moments onto the object. So our input to this rigid body is the force and the moment. And as a result of that, we have this rigid body motion where these things, Q and C, result from the application of the force on the moment. And therefore, I don't know what these are. These are things that I need to determine. That is the difficulty, or that's the object of rigid body dynamics. Uh, so how do I determine them? So that's what I'd like to give you a short idea about. And I essentially want to summarize that all we need is out there. Okay. So what are Q and C? So first of all, uh, let me state the balance laws because that's what governs the relation between kinetics and kinematics. So we have the force and in item number two we have proven that Um, the rate of change of linear momentum is expressed simply in terms of the acceleration of the center of mass. So I've just introduced a notation here, A bar as the acceleration of the center of mass times the total mass of the object, right? So if I apply a certain force, then in principle I can directly solve for A. Right, acceleration of the center of mass, and the acceleration will help in updating the value of the center of mass. And this now will have me, give me some information about Q and C because we can realize that the velocity at the center of mass is nothing but the velocity in general evaluated at the center of mass. The center of mass is a material point. On the reference configuration, it has position x bar. So if I calculate the velocity, which I can do so immediately from here, it's q dot x c dot. And now, since the center of mass is a material point, if I plug in here x bar, then I'll obtain the velocity of the center of mass at any point. So now, therefore, if I update the velocity, the velocity is in terms of q dot and c dot, so I have some information about the rate at which q dot and c dot evolve. This by itself, of course, it's not enough to solve for what q and c are, or q dot and c dot are, because I have two variables and here there is only one equation, but I will proceed with now the angular momentum balance, which will give me uh, more information. So um, let me call this equation one. And you may want to notice at this stage that this is not equal to c dot. The center of mass velocity is not equal to c dot. It involves q as well. OK, so equation number one is something that I have in my disposal uh, as I'm trying to determine what Q and C are. So I now move on to the angular momentum balance. And here I'm going to make use of identities 3 all the way through 6. 6 is what we have just derived. 
And the angular momentum balance in the form we have derived, it's a convenient form, says that the moment that you exert with respect to the center of mass is equal to the rate of change of the total angular momentum with respect to the center of mass. So that's a result that we have proved last time. Normally it's with respect to a stationary point, but CM is one particular moving point with respect to that balance, with, with, with respect to which the balance law holds. But not only that, there's another convenience. We've shown that HCM, the total angular momentum, actually has a very simple expression with respect to the center of mass. With respect to an arbitrary point, we're going to discuss shortly, that's not necessarily the case, okay? So this always holds, right? Um, and, well, what is omega? Well, omega, let's remember, is equal to, or it's a quantity that tells us the rate at which the relative position with respect to the center of mass changes, and it is associated with the, or it is the axial vector, the angular velocity, the axial vector of a skew symmetric tensor, which is equal to Q dot Q transpose, okay? This is just a summary of what we have previously defined. And what is JCM? Well, it's not something I need to always calculate. If I know what Q is, and if I know what J not CM is, it follows through a very specific update. So what we're seeing so far here is everything that appears is somehow linked to Q so far. So now I need to take this H and plug it into that expression. So um, if you do that, okay, you will obtain that. Uh, there are two terms, right? So it's the rate of J times omega plus J multiplying omega uh, dot. So let me call this alpha because that's typically what you use in undergraduate dynamics. So just like we saw that V bar is not equal to C dot, we also here see that in general, M, the moment, is not inertia times acceleration, but there is an additional term. And that additional term comes from the fact that when a complex object rotates, its moment of inertia tensor also evolves. So that's that additional term that you probably often omit or don't see in 2D. So this is not equal to JCM alpha. Okay. Um, so now what is this term on the other hand? Let me write that with a different color because that's something you're going to show as a small exercise uh, in the next homework. So you will show that J dot CM omega can be expressed uh, conveniently as omega cross J CM omega, okay? So that's a nice, simple expression. And therefore, as a result, we have that the total moment is equal to omega cross J CM omega plus J CM alpha, all right? Um, okay, so just like I did up there, what I could in principle do is if I know what the moment is at any given time instant, um, suppose I know what J is and I know what omega is and I'd like to determine the rate at which it evolves, that's precisely alpha, I can solve for alpha from that equation, right? So. As I did up there, or similar to that step, solve for alpha, and I can update omega, okay? Um, so essentially, uh, we have all we need out here. Um, let me also write here that suppose you know, so, so suppose you know what omega is. If you know what omega is, we know how to construct from a skew from a axial vector, the skew symmetric tensor that it belongs to. This is something you did in homework number uh, two. 
And so if I know omega, I can calculate the tensor omega. And if I know tensor omega, I can calculate um, q dot is equal to capital omega q. Okay. And let me call this equation uh, number two. So overall, when you look at this picture, what you see is the following. So you have an object. And this is a rigid object. And to this object, you're going to apply a certain force and a moment. Um, and as a result of those, the body is going to go through a rigid body motion where there are some quantities q and c. And if you know what these are, then you can update the configuration of the object, its position and its orientation in space, right? So conceptually, perhaps not in practice, but conceptually, q and c are what I'd like to find. There are two quantities, right? And three independent degrees of freedom in each of them, because that's a skew tensor. Um, so that's a rotation tensor, but it's related to a skew tensor. Um, so I need two equations conceptually for two unknowns. So the first equation comes from the linear momentum balance. And I can update the velocity. And velocity is related to q dot and c dot. Okay, So that's one equation. Then I have a moment. And in terms of the moment, somehow I can go and find the acceleration for omega. And eventually, I can find what omega is. And once I know what omega is, I have another equation for the rate of change of q. So I have one equation here, another equation there, which should be sufficient for updating the values of q and c, which determine exactly the position and orientation of the object. Okay? So conceptually, I have enough information that I can work with to update the configuration of this rigid body. Now, in practice, is that what you do? Probably not. In practice, um, what one typically does is, or what one would like to do is, you'd like to describe the orientation of the object in a more elegant manner, not directly through, uh, in this case, Q. Perhaps you don't want to construct it. And one way to do that, and I'll just write it here and stop right there, uh, one would use Euler's angles or something called quaternions to describe and update the orientation of an object in 3D, okay, of a rigid object. Um, so, so in practice, the procedure might, uh, might differ, but let me say conceptually, I just wanted to show on one board that what we have done so far uh, using the language of continuum mechanics, uh, co compactly derive the set of expressions that govern in an efficient manner in some sense, right? Uh, the motion of a rigid body, okay? All right. Questions about the summary? Well, how would it change? For instance, this object presently with respect to the axis has a certain moment of inertia, right? And now if the object moves, and it rotates into that configuration with respect to the same axis. Now it has a different moment of inertia. So the fact that it's moving will cause the components of the moment of inertia uh, to change. Yeah, but not looking at the system, the uh, right. So remember that, the, OK, that's a good question. You could work in a clever manner. Um, you could, in fact, you could, in fact, um, work with the concept that you just described. So he's asking about attaching coordinate systems onto the body. Okay? That information is somewhat in there. You could do that. But when we express the components, often we use a fixed basis set, EI. Right? So with respect to a fixed basis set, it's going to change. But, but we, that's exactly an example that we've covered before. If you make the basis rotate, then the components with respect to the rotating bases will not change. That's probably what you're asking. Right? OK. So that's pretty much uh, a nice or neat summary of where we are in rigid body dynamics. So at this point, um, we've accomplished partially the goal, but that's not always what we're interested in. We're interested in also, let's say, in energy. And we're also interest, interested in sometimes expressing 
this equation with respect to not the center of mass, but to some other point in cases of practical interest. So those are two aspects that I'd like to uh, discuss further. And I'll start with the energy. And what we will do is we will prove something that is called the Koenig's de decomposition. So this is now item number seven. So Koenig's decomposition uh, says that the total kinetic energy of a rigid body can be decomposed into a translational and a rotational part. Or let me say a pure translational and a pure rotational part. Okay. So let me first state the kinetic energy and have a look for a second uh, because I don't have time to uh, redraw the picture of rigid body motion. So I'll remind you of a number of quantities and then if you like you can write on the fly. So the kinetic energy of course is equal to one half integral over the rigid body rho, the sum of the incremental energies of the particles. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the velocity of a particle using the velocity of the center of mass, that's V bar, but that's of course not V. There is also the velocity with respect to the center of mass, and that is what we called R bar dot. Okay? So that's the only trick. So R bar dot V bar dV. And now I'm just going to manipulate this expression systematically uh, as I prove or derive this result. Right? Um, so if you like, you can, you can write on the fly. Um, so this is equal to right, 1 half. I'm just going to multiply these terms out. So there is a v dot v bar dot v bar. V bar is something that belongs to the center of mass, so it's a constant for integration purposes. What remains is simply integral rho dv over the object, and that is the mass. So v bar dot v bar. In fact, that is already the translational energy. So mass, one half, velocity of the center of mass. So we've already mapped one term. The rest of the effort will go into identifying the rotational energy and expressing that. So let me write out the rest of the terms. So we have v bar dot r bar dot and also an r bar dot v dot v bar. So there are two of those terms. It's going to cancel this one half. So integral over r, v bar is a constant for integration purposes. So, so we have rho r bar dot dv plus there is one half r bar dot r bar dot. So a number of tricks that we've used so far. So first of all, I know this is something I've written before, I believe. Um, so this expression is equivalent to DDT, rho r bar dv. So whenever rho dv is in the expression, I can move directly the time derivative onto that item that appears in the integration. Um, because I can pull back and push forward, right? And as soon as I do that, this is the center of, this is the relative position with respect to the center of mass, mean position with respect to the center of mass. So uh, that's equal to zero, as we've discussed. So that's equal to zero, and hence the time derivative uh, drops out. So the second term I, is something I don't have to worry about. So this is the term that will cause a little bit of complication. Now, r bar dot is omega cross r bar. And uh, to manipulate that expression, what I'll do is I'll write out the terms actually um, item by item in terms of components. So uh, the first one is going to be, so first of all, 
I'll incorporate the permutation symbol. It's a dot product. The dummy index is i. And this one is jk omega j r bar k. And for this one, I'll pick m and n, omega m r bar n. Okay. So that let me call star. Now, let's leave it there. I'll move to the new board. Let me continue in green. Um, so I'm working on star. So that's equal to E I J K E I M N. And then omega J R bar K omega M R bar N. And now on that term, I will employ the E delta identity. So this is equal to delta JM delta KN minus JN KM. And now I have uh, Kronecker deltas flying all over the place. I'll just carry out the substitution into the indexes of the quantities that I have over there. So for instance, I will have m substituted there, two m's, omega m, omega m. And then k, that will give me an n, r bar n, r bar n, minus the second set of terms. Let me group them suggestively like this. And then I have omega m r bar m r bar n omega m. OK, and that's a scalar quantity, right? I'm not skipping any basis. You can always fill in the blanks. I'm not skipping too many steps. It's actually, I'm not skipping any step. Uh, but you can throw in more details if you want. So now I look at these expressions and I try to recognize uh, what they are. So this is a omega dot omega omega dot omega. And in between, there is a r bar dot r bar. If I throw in an identity there, nothing will change. It's still omega. But it's nice if I group these terms like this. It's for me more suggestive eventually. And when I look at these terms, I can write them as omega dotting, dotted with r bar bond r bar operating on omega. Okay, so now I have omega dot some tensor operating on omega. So I can write this as omega dot r bar dot r bar identity minus r bar bond r bar. So I've simplified whatever appears in this integral. Okay. Now I'm going to continue. I'm going to say it's equal to. So everything in green is, a, uh, is extra work. I'm continuing from the expression for the kinetic energy. So what I have here is 1 over 2 m v bar dot v bar plus 1 half omega dot an integral over r, the density multiplying r bar dot r bar identity minus r bar bond r bar dv omega. Okay. So I've substituted green into the last expression for the last term uh, in the kinetic energy. And now this is what I recognize now to be the inertia tensor with respect to center of mass by definition. So we have essentially a part that has to do with the translational motion, which translational motion of 
V rigid body. So that's described by V bar, velocity of the center of mass. So that is T translational. And we have another term that has to do with rotation because rotation occurs through omega. If there is no rotation, omega is equal to zero. That term drops out. If the center of mass doesn't move anywhere, it can still rotate, but then this term will drop out. So we have a decomposition into unique terms that have to do with that translational and rotational parts of the kinetic energy. And that's one neat result that characterizes the total kinetic energy of a rigid body. Okay, so let me just check my expressions. Okay. All right, so now we're moving on to the last item in the list. Um, that's going to be item number eight. And we are going to analyze the possibility of, um, or we're going to discuss the possibility of analyzing the motion of a rigid body with respect to a fixed point. Okay? And if we like to do that, something that proves useful is the so-called parallel axis theorem that you will recall, again, from undergraduate dynamics. So the parallel axis theorem states that if you like to calculate the moment of inertia with respect to a point other than the center of mass, what you have to do is calculate the inertia with respect to center of mass and add an expression that characterizes the additional inertia of the center of mass with respect to the fixed point. Okay? And this is a simple expression. So this is hard. It requires integration. That's hard. It requires integration. They can both be directly calculated. But if you calculate one of them, let's say that one, this, it turns out, is a very simple in, in, uh, expression that does not require integration, right? Um, so, and as I make the derivation, we will see what that simple term um, looks like. Okay, so I'll start with J naught because I understand what I mean by a inertia with respect to a point. So I take the relative position with respect to that point. In this case, it is, um, with respect to point x naught, which is fixed in space, remember. Okay. So all I've done is previously I had JCM, there I had R bar. Here, instead of R bar, I'm throwing in R naught. Okay. Um, and I am going to use, or I'm going to express R naught through alternative terms, okay? So, I don't have the picture, but you do have the picture in your notebooks. But let me remind you in words what these quantities are. R naught is the relative position of a material point with respect to a fixed point in space. This point doesn't move anywhere. This one does. Now, additionally, we have R bar, which indicates the position of, the same, of a material point again, but this time, with respect to the center of mass. And finally, I had introduced with, I think, a dotted red line on the original figure, R bar naught, which indicates the relative position of the center of mass with respect to, a, uh, with respect to the fixed point x naught. So these are all definitions that you will see in the picture. Now, therefore, what I can do is I can go into um, that expression, R naught, the first one. And instead of x, I can write r bar plus x bar. Okay. And then instead of x naught, I can write x bar minus r bar naught. Okay. And therefore, you see that x bars cancel. From the figure, you can find this more easily, of course that R naught is equal to R bar plus R bar naught, okay? Okay, and now I'm going to take that expression and plug it in there. Okay, so we have J naught equals integral over R rho 
using that result, let me put brackets here, r bar plus r bar not dot r bar plus r bar not identity minus r bar um, plus r bar not bun r bar plus r bar not db. And thus, we have plenty of terms there. I just need to multiply everything out and integrate them uh, or group them together. OK, so we just multiply them out together um, carefully. So first of all, you can throw in the immediately, imme immediately uh, striking terms, which are just extracting, let's say, the R bars here, or R bar nuts. Okay? Of course, there are additional terms, but first, let me write those. And I'll start from the very left with the hope that I'll be able to fit everything in there. Um, so I have first integral over rho, integral over r, rho r bar dot r bar identity minus r bar bun r bar dv plus integral over r, rho r bar not dot r bar not identity minus r bar not bun r bar not, okay? Now, however, there are also terms like r bar not dot r bar, and there are terms like r bar bun r bar not. So those I also have to include. Let me include those separately with a different color. Um, so first of all, I have r not r bar not dot r bar, and also r bar dot r bar not. Two of those terms. So that's twice. R bar not is a constant for integration purposes because it's the relative position of the center of mass with respect to this fixed point. I already took it outside of the integral, dotted with integral over uh, r, rho, r bar, dv, multiplying identity. Okay. And likewise, here I have two terms. They are not symmetric, so I cannot write a two. I have to write them separately. There is a r bar not which is, again, a constant for integration purposes, bun rho r bar, okay, uh, minus the same thing, integral rho r bar dv bun r bar not. Okay, and now, Integral rho r bar not, again and again I've used this, it's equal to zero. Equal to zero, equal to zero. So actually the terms in green are terms which identically drop out, and I, all I'm left with are these two quantities. Now, the first quantity is nothing but the moment of inertia with respect to the center of mass. Okay. And therefore, what I have remaining should be interpreted as the moment of inertia of the center of mass with respect to the fixed point. And indeed, it is so because r bar naught represents precisely that term. It's the relative position of the center of mass with respect to this point, fixed point. So this is the inertia of the center of mass with respect to this fixed point. So this is equal to j. CM O. Okay. Uh, now, however, R bar naught is a constant for integration purposes. Only here I did not take it outside of the integral yet, so that you can see the exact transition. Now, if I take all of these terms outside, what I have is integral over R rho, which is just mass. So that's equal to mass multiplying R bar naught 
dot r bar naught minus r bar naught bon r bar naught. There is an identity here. So that's a simple expression. It doesn't need any calculation. As soon as you know the relative position of the center of mass with respect to the fixed point, just evaluate this term. It's a simple tensor and add it to JCM. That's your J naught. Well, it's nothing more, more than a series of careful manipulations. But why do we need it? So why would we be interested in the moment of inertia with respect to a point other than the center of mass. So now, uh, that is going to be a remark that actually we have to be careful about. Now, we do have, of course, the relation which says that if you like to work with the linear angular momentum balance, in fact, this is the original statement which says that the net moment about the fixed point, x naught, is the is equal to the rate of change of the total angular momentum with respect to that point. Now, what we've done is we've reformulated that with respect to the center of mass. And with respect to the center of mass, the same expression holds. Now, the nice thing, however, with respect to the center of mass is that HCM is expressed in a very simple manner. Right? So now the question is, whether for instance that would hold right because the reason you want to introduce a tensor is so that it simplifies your calculations and this would be indeed one way to simplify the calculation so then you can throw an h naught in there and work with moment versus the uh, angular velocity and that if you remember the summary right uh, where we discuss how these equations are useful. Here I'm using the center of mass. You can now translate the whole discussion with respect to, or state the discussion in terms of the fixed point x naught, right? Um, right? So that would give you an alternative picture of what is going on. Now, however, the problem is that this is not true in general. And that's what I'd like to show you or remind you uh, correctly, um, quickly. So to see this, so namely that this does not hold in general, let us go back to equation um, or result three that we discussed where we were trying to uh, express the total angular momentum with respect to x naught okay, in terms of the angular momentum with respect to the center of mass plus, of course, something else. And we found out that that something else is x bar minus x naught cross the total linear momentum. Okay. So first of all, now we know that HCM is JCM omega. And we also know that x bar minus x naught is nothing but from the identities that I have written on the previous board. It's the relative position of the center of mass with respect to the fixed point, so it's r bar naught. And p, if you recall, uh, that was from item two that we have discussed, it's equal to m v bar. Okay? And that holds in general, uh, deformable or not deformable, but we're discussing here rigid bodies strictly. right? Especially terms like this require that we have rigid bodies. OK, so that's an expression which I have. And now let me concentrate on this term here. Okay. Um, and just call that star, but I'll continue with black. So now, um, if, okay, now this is a special statement. There might be other cases where this statement holds. I'm just going to state one case, but that one case is not true in general. And the statement is if v bar is equal to omega cross r bar naught, okay, that's not necessarily true.
In fact, even in 2D, okay? And let me give you a, just, just draw two examples here for which, well, for one, one of them will satisfy this, one of them will not. So suppose I have the fixed point O, right? And that's like a hinge and there is, a, or that, that's just a point, sorry. And the center of mass is over here. Okay, so this is the center of mass. And the body is attached to some point, fixed point, um, at its center of mass, and the body is a simple circle or a disk, and it's rotating with angular velocity omega. And this distance is precisely in 2D as a scalar. It's the distance of the center of mass with respect to that fixed point or not. So the center of mass velocity in 2D, well, it doesn't have any velocity, so I'll just write zero. You could assign it some random direction is not equal to omega times r bar naught. It's not, it's zero. The object has an angular velocity. There is a relative position between the center of mass and a fixed point, but the velocity is zero. It's not equal to this. So this does not hold in general. When does it hold? Let me draw one case. So that's a big cross. And here's a case where it would hold. I have the fixed point O, and that is now a hinge. And now I have a, let's say, a rigid rod that is connected to the center of mass of the disk. And this disk is now swinging about this fixed point with the angular velocity omega, okay? And uh, this is the center of mass. And this distance is r bar naught. The velocity at that point, it's v bar. And v bar, in this case, is equal to omega r bar naught, okay? So in this case, that expression makes sense, okay? But in this case, it's not true. So this is something that is not true in general. But suppose it holds, for instance, in the second case. So here, it does hold. That's a check, right? So if it holds, then I can go ahead and plug in that expression over here. And what I have is, then, what I called star, right, is equal to um, mass r bar naught cross omega cross r bar naught. Now, what you can do is you can look at um, our derivation associated with the moment of inertia tensor. And as we were driving the moment of inertia tensor, at some point we had an expression like this. And I converted that expression into the final expression for the inertia tensor. And that expression is precisely equal to, if you plug it in, J C M O. Okay. So the transition is the same. Once you make the transition, multiply it with M. This is the inertia tensor of the center of mass with respect to the fixed point, which we have just derived. When you make the transition, you obtain that, you see that this term is exactly JCMO multiplying omega, okay? Okay, so H naught is HCM plus an additional term. That additional term is some general term. I have assumed a special expression for the velocity of the center of mass in terms of the relative position with respect to the fixed point and the angular velocity. And then I've simplified that expression, the second contribution making use of that special expression. And that's the simplification for a very special case. So now, if we do all of that, then I can finally express H naught as JCM plus JCMO multiplying omega. 
both expressions are a tensor multiplying omega, and what's in between is nothing but the inertia tensor with respect to the fixed point O. Okay, so that's why you would need that tensor. You need that additional tensor because in some special cases it allows you to express the angular momentum balance in a neat manner, but that is a special case. It's not something you can do in general. So, so, so the question is, what's the definition of omega? I'm using the definition that you already know from undergraduate dynamics. So in this case, it's rotation thing about itself. So this position, its radial position keeps changing. Time derivative is omega. And in this case, the center of mass rotates around a circle. Same discussion. The angular velocity is omega. This may or may not be rotating additionally about itself. And that, of course, in general would influence what omega means in 3D. But here, assume if you like that this object is just fixed, so it cannot rotate about this. Okay. So it's just swinging, let's say, like a pendulum okay, about that fixed point. You just, just think of it as simple as possible. This is just to, you don't have to relate directly that to that. It's just to give you an idea that there are cases where that expression holds, and there are cases where it wouldn't hold. Okay. Follow up? Right, right, right. It's not rotating about O, but it's rotating about itself. It's a scalar about its center of mass, okay? I don't, I, we're not analyzing these cases, right? It's just one, I'm just trying to give you examples, very, very simple examples for when it does not hold and when it does hold. So that's how far we will go with this particular special topic. As with remaining special topics, I've tried to give you a taste of what it's going to be like. Uh, I mention objects, well, concepts here and there. Some of them I do rigorously. Some of them I discuss broadly just so you hear about them. Again, the goal is to see how continuum mechanics plays an instrumental role in expressing some ideas and driving uh, expressions that are useful to you for further analysis. It's not an end in its own. That's just the start. Then if you're interested in rigid body dynamics, there's, of course, a lot to do there. Uh, some things you will have a chance to further examine during the midterm and the final exams, as with other special topics, some of them in the homework. But that's how much we will do in the lectures. Okay? And that's the end of the first special topic. Next time, we continue with um, linear elasticity, actually. Okay? So I'll see you next time.